Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm actually glad to be here in Vermont. I'd, I've been here before. Um, I actually grew up very close to here. I grew up in Rome, New York. I don't know, if, who, who knows Rome, New York? Oh, wow, okay. Uh, Rome's kind of not the end of the world, but it's pretty close to it. Um, Rome has kind of destroyed itself to the point where this is how we market ourselves. Our, our Chamber of Commerce puts this out, like, hey, if you're in Albany, why not take a two-hour drive to Rome? Um, <laughs> I like this. Rome is in the middle of all the action in upstate New York. We don't even have action. So it's like, that's cool. Well, Rome actually started in a pretty uh, good spot. It was the center point of the Erie Canal. So if you all ever sang the Erie Canal song in grade school and you sang about the mule named Sal, you actually talk about Rome in the, in this, in the song. Um, but that was the high point. The Erie Canal started there and went east and west. Rome actually vied to be the state capital at one point in time and came in second to Albany. This is what my hometown used to look like back in the day. And when I was a kid, it, it, during, in the 70s, it suffered a lot of the Rust Belt decline that a lot of the Erie Canal towns did. Um, and they started coming up with these Hail Mary passes to save their downtown. Uh, one of my favorite ideas was this idea to uh, rebuild the, the Fort Stanwix. So you all remember your pivotal Revolutionary War history? You remember Fort Stanwix, the Battle of Fort Stanwix? It wasn't all that pivotal. But um, we had this really unfortunate situation that our downtown was essentially built on top where the mall was, so, or on top of where the, uh, where, the, where the fort was. So when I was a kid, they tore all of this stuff down, and um, we, got, we got this. So we have these Italian guys that dress up like revolutionaries and, and red coats, and they have got musket battles, and most of us weren't even here um, in this, on this country. O occasionally, we get a Canadian tourist, and that's about it. <laughs> And, and if that wasn't enough, they expanded the downtown urban renewal district outside the fort, and they did a pedestrian mall because, hey, it's the 70s. Everybody needs a pedestrian mall. Um, on the pedestrian mall, they did, a, they did an, a, a four acre open space because apparently 12 acres of open space wasn't enough. And then you, you have this big field around the fort. Um, a couple parking garages because, hey, y'all are going to drive over to Rome and go visit the fort, right? Um, a new city hall, and because that parking deck was way too far away at 110 feet, they built a surface lot for the people that were too lazy to park there. Uh, a mall over here, and then the craziest thing was like Le Corbusier meets the Ponte Vecchio, this thing called the Living Bridge that shot out over a highway. Um, this was the first time I ever saw an escalator. My brothers and I would get on that escalator and ride up and down, up and down. Um, it was really exciting. And of the 280 businesses that got checks, for revitalization in the area, their businesses were torn down. Of the 280 businesses, 18 of them relocated in this project area. The other 215 of them just moved on. That's what happened in my hometown when I was a kid. It just, we got a fort. And I thought this was normal. Um, I didn't like the lake effect snow. I actually like snow, but you know, it kind of gets wears on you after a while. And I thought, hey, I'm gonna go to school down in Miami. Um, because I'll be on, on a beach. Well, I chose the wrong program. I chose architecture. And if you go to an architecture program, any architects in the audience, you generally don't leave the building the entire time. Um, but these two were toying with this idea of new urbanism. And what was fascinating to me was this landscape that they were rallying against, these monolithic cultures of, of development, these the congested roadways of South Florida, these inhospitable places for people. To me, to come from the Northeast to go down there and see this was, was wild. It was eye-opening that people are actually building at this scale. And in a way, we used to lampoon it as this cartoon of suburban sprawl, but the sad thing is it's a real place. This is San Antonio, that people were building these kinds of landscapes. While I was in architecture school, I went to another Rome. I went to Rome, Italy, and did a semester abroad program. I lived here, I went to school there, and I ate there. And it kind of made me wrestle with this thing, like, what, what's going on here? Why is my Rome dead as a doornail, didn't even make it 200 years, and this Rome has been going on for 2,000 years? What is it with cities? How do they operate? And the best way that I think of it is cities all have a DNA. Burlington's got a DNA. So does whatever town you came from. It has a DNA. It has a trajectory. It's either growing or it's dying, right? So I have a DNA. This is me when I was three months old, when I had hair, and this is my trajectory, right? So I know... <laughs> I know I'm going to be Papa, whether I like it or not. Or more importantly, I know I'm going to be this guy. Again, when I had hair. Now, I'm genetically Italian. I can't change that. We also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease. So I know I'm going to have that heart disease, right? Now, I can choose to ignore it, 
or I can choose to plan for it. I can actually eat right, exercise more, check on my cholesterol. There's data points that I can work on to manage my growth. I have a model. So what's your model? Who are you going to be when you grow up? What's your path? You know, a lot of people are just like, well, no, we're just going to close the doors. That's it. We're done. It's like, no, you can't. You're either going forward or backward. What do you want to do? Like your bodies, right? So um, Asheville. Uh, who's, who's all been to Asheville? Oh, cool. Um, Asheville's very much like, like your town. We started differently, though. Um, we're about four hours northeast of Atlanta. Um, beautiful setting. We're the other end of Appalachia. Um, bluegrass music, beer. We've got 40 breweries. We're 90,000 people. That's like 5,000 people per brewery if you want to do the math on that. We drink a lot. Um, and like any quirky little mountain town, we have men dressed as nuns on tall bikes that eat fire. It's your typical little place, right? Um, this is how Asheville started in the 1800s. 15 years after this picture was taken, same location, this is what happened to Asheville. We exploded. We like to say the three T's made Asheville, trains, tourism, and tuberculosis. Then once the train lines came down, it brought a flood of tourism. Um, we had, uh, oops, sorry, the second streetcar line in the entire country. Um, presidents came to visit, presidents still visit. During the 1920s, we were growing at 20% in population every year of the decade. This 14-story building was built in 1927 by a 27-year-old. Um, we were the second largest city in North Carolina. So the only city that was bigger than, North, than, than Asheville was Winston-Salem. So you heard of Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, Wilmington. We were bigger than all of them. Uh, we achieved the highest debt per capita of the entire United States. We were number one in debt. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> And when the, when the Depression hit and our books were audited, we thought we had $5 million in the bank. It turned out we had 18000 A little clerical error there. <laughs> and our entire, entire city council was indicted. The mayor committed suicide. That's leadership in Asheville right there. That's how we entered the Depression. Thomas Wolfe, author of the book Look Homeward Angel, wrote this about his hometown. Asheville has squandered fabulous sums. They've flung away the earnings of a lifetime. They've mortgaged those of a generation to come. They have ruined a city. And in doing so, they've ruined themselves, their children, and their children's children. Now, I don't know many of y'all that have lived in the South. I know Eliza's here. Um, this is not something you say in a southern town. Um, this is seen as impolite when you name names. He was threatened. His family was threatened. He basically stayed in New York City because he didn't want to get beat up. His second book was called You Can't Go Home Again for obvious reasons. So if you know where that term came from. But he was right. This would have a, a, a generational effect on our community. It would take us until 1976 to pay off the debt. Part of the New Deal program was absolving debt to a lot of communities that overextended themselves in the 1920s. Asheville chose to not, to not take that New Deal program. We were essentially the proto-Tea Party. You know, so when you hear about Asheville as being this liberal town, it really is, but it's just sitting inside this kind of, uh, it's like a, a liberal center inside a cookie crust of conservatism. Um, we chose to pay that debt off. It took us until 1976 to pay it off. You can tell it's a big deal because we get these three guys to burn the bond. You get, you get Miss Asheville to wear a tiara. And then you teleprompter and Billy Graham. When Billy shows up, it's a big deal. And, but what's crazy is to show you the damage to us and how we felt, it's the third story in the paper. Behind abortions and somebody dying in a prison fire. This isn't even our county. That's the next county over. That shows you how embarrassed we were about this. But when we got out of that debt, we started cooking with gas. We started building a highway across the town, which is a crosstown expressway, uh, just right through the middle of the downtown here, or the edge. And the coup de grace was when we blew open the mountain. This is called Bow Catcher Cut. Um, incidentally, I love that it's on a postcard. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> it, come, come visit our cut. Maybe some people from Colorado will show up and like scale that or something. Um, there were actual people that fought this in Asheville. Uh, they took it all the way to federal court and lost because apparently NCDOT, our state DOT, didn't have the technology to do a tunnel. They wanted to do a tunnel. Um, and apparently some lost civilization of humanoids that left us the tunnel right there, uh, that, that didn't transfer. Um, on the other side of the cut, the mall happened and our downtown died. So when you come to Asheville now, you see a spectacular place, but it wasn't all that spectacular not too long ago. These, all the buildings were boarded up. We were essentially po too poor to tear them down. This is a 1996 Chevy Celebrity right here. Look at this wonderful fixer-upper. Why don't you all move to Asheville and put some elbow grease into this puppy, right? Um, like a Greek choir, anytime somebody tried to fix downtown or do something downtown, there was this resistance. That won't work here, don't even try. 
We're a bunch of mountain people. We're not city people. We're not them city folk like, like Charleston or New Orleans. That's not who we are. Do y'all have people like this around here? You know, <laughs> cities are places for people. We've inhabited cities for tens of thousands of years. It's our invention. This is what works for us economically, right? So um, there are people that did do things differently. This is Julian Price. He's from Greensboro. Uh, he was living in Seattle. He inherited a bunch of money. His family's like, please come back to Greensboro. And he stopped in Asheville. That was as close as he wanted to get to his family. He took, he took his inheritance and turned it into a real estate development company. He put $15 million into public interest projects, a for-profit real estate development company. I worked with them. And 75% of the money we would use to fix buildings. And we would reserve 25% of his money to seed businesses. So what we were doing was trying to get people living downtown, a very Jane Jacobs thing, just put people downtown, but they need things to do, right? So rather than put a recreation room in one of our buildings, we made, we made a nightclub. This is uh, the Orange Peel. It's one of the top five nightclubs in the entire country. I got punched in the back by Taj Mahal in the basement. That was kind of cool. <laughs> um, he was really excited about the barbecue that we gave him. But um, we created the first vegetarian restaurant in the city. Banks would fund it because they, it's all they saw on the menu was vegetables, and we're like, Everybody in Asheville eats that. Um, so we put money behind it. Now Asheville is one of the top 10 vegetarian cities in the entire country. Um, and it's one of our buildings before and after. Uh, bookstore, apartments above. Uh, this is a mixed use project we just did with the city with uh, housing on the back, a hotel up here, and then a city parking deck. So rather than just have a city parking deck just with no tax base, Let's go ahead and wrap the whole thing with taxes so it's a win-win situation. The community gets parking, and we all get taxes, and you're getting housing and a hotel um, into the project. This is a three-way public-private partnership. Um, we weren't treated fairly by our community, of course, because we're ripacious scumbag developers. Uh, this is how we got treated for doing the right thing in our community. You know, sometimes you have to take the lumps in your community that people just don't understand the depth of what a city is. And we were willing to do that. So here we are, like the, the people that made the vegetarian community happen, getting punched in the face by the newspaper that we actually started. And that's one of the dirty sides of Asheville. Um, one of the other things that Julian did, Julian passed away in 2001. This is what Asheville looked like um, in, in 1993 when he published his own newspaper. And in it, he would constantly try to raise the spirits of the children's children. Have some sense of pride of your community. Are you going to just put up billboards all over the place? And I love this quote that he uses from Arthur Frommer. Among cities with no recreation appeal, those that have preserved their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that haven't receive almost no tourism at all. Tourism simply doesn't go to a city that's lost its soul. In a way, he's trying to lift up their spirits. You know, just have some pride, right? 15, Arthur, he used Arthur Frommer as a quote. 15 years later, Frommer's magazine would list us as the number five place in the country to visit. Just two years ago, we got listed number one, which is kind of crazy. We get 10 million tourists a year that come through my county, mostly to come to my city. So that's why we have all these breweries. I can't drink all that beer. I can't eat at all 75 restaurants in my city. We've got 17 sushi joints. We're nowhere near an ocean. And it's all because of this commerce that makes my place a nice place to live that people actually show up on vacation there. That's cool. Um, but that's, there's data behind this. What's going on? What's going on within the community? This is the value of downtown. So if we're a $15 million investor inside a portfolio called Downtown Asheville, all the collective buildings are worth $100 million. Just to fix the buildings that are already there, this is what happened to the value of the community. It went from $100 million to $500 million in that 15-year window. Now, to show you that it's not all love and roses in Asheville, these are some of the political ads from the 1990s. I love this. This is the guy, this guy, Chris Peterson. And look at this guy. He's crying. Poor guy. He's got this whole past council decisions. $26 million for streetscape projects and parking garages. Downtown development for bureaucrats instead of water, sewer, streets for our citizen. Downtown parking fiasco. Millions of dollars wasted, right? Do y'all have people like this? I mean, he's right. $26 million is a lot of money. I don't have $26 million in my pocket. But let's do some math here. If y'all invest $26 million on a $100 million asset and it grows $450 million, is investing 26 and getting back 450 is that a good return on investment? Why the hell do we listen to Chris? You know, Chris has amped up his game now. Now he's got websites. And I asked the mayor, I was like, is that a liquor drink? And she's like, it should be. You know, this is... <laughs> 
you know, people can have their opinions, but they're not entitled to facts. They're not entitled to their own data set. So put the math out there and figure out what's going on. We can talk about anything we want, but then there's reality, right? So this gets me to a concept. We, in the mayor, we, we talked about this in, in, uh, in Maine, just a loss of civics and how we talk about what cities are. We, we tend to have this very like, emotive conversation about it. This is a kid's book that I found in a garage sale. The City, the Town, and the Country. Teacher's Guide, City, Town, Country, right? 1959, third grade. So in kindergarten, you learn about your house. First grade, the school. Second grade, your neighborhood. Third grade, you learn about regional planning. <laughs> it has things like this. While patterns vary from state to state, counties are usually responsible to some degree for education, library, health, welfare, blah, blah, blah. And studying the functions performed by your county, you will no doubt find there's a duplication of services and overlapping of jurisdictions and a lack of coordination between your county and your local community. <laughs> Does that happen here? 1959. Here's a lesson. Now, it's the 50s. It's painfully white, so there's all white kids here. It's a little bit misogynistic. The girls are shoved out in the hallway with the overcrowding because apparently girls don't need an education in the 50s. But um, you read about a factory that gets built. More families move to town. There's even more kids that go to school. So in blue, you ask your third graders this question. Give four good reasons for building a new school. Your third graders talk about equity. Everybody should have a desk. Everybody should be in the classroom, right? Fairness. You read on about Mr. Canfield, who lived next door to the Allens. He didn't want a new school. He said, our taxes are too high now. If we build a new school, we'll need more teachers and everything else to run the school, and we'll have to pay our taxes. Fair question for a third grader. <laughs> Why would some people have to pay higher taxes if a new school were built? So now, all of a sudden, we're talking about cost of community infrastructure. I want a greenway. Well, what does that cost? Where does that money come from? This is third graders, people. I love this. Again, reminding you about your third graders, this is what, as a teacher, remember too that many children, whether urban and rural and regardless of region, are tragically limited in their knowledge of their world. Their world is largely the space in which they live and operate. I know adults that have this tragic limitation. You know, it's like, I don't have a parking space downtown. Where's my parking space? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. We're going to like bend the world for you. You know, it's just, stuff costs money, people. Where do you get your money? So the city, is essentially a finite boundary of land. My state has made my city, it is illegal for the city of North Carolina, or Asheville, to, to annex more land. My state has made it illegal in the state charter for my city, the only city in the state is not allowed to annex land. If you want to have fun, come to North Carolina. Try our politics. Um, so, but my city, with that finite boundary of land, is a corporation. So if you look up the word incorporate, it says, to, and this is out of Oxford Dictionary, to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. So Burlington's a corporation. You have your CEO over here. Uh, my city is worth $12.8 billion. So if, as a corporation, my mayor is six times the value of Ted Turner. Does she wake up and think that? Does she look at the data? Or more importantly, let's compare them against some of your rich people. My, my, my city is worth 128 times Mr. Carpenter, or four times your billionaire. Do these people wake up and just kind of emotively make a choice about what they're going to do that day? Or are they going to look at the data of how their investments are going and how to better invest in their, in their corporations? So, and it's not just your city or your state, also our country. This is, I was blown away when Joe Biden said this on the Stephen Colbert show, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. I was like, damn, is that right? So I looked it up, U.S. Code, Title 28, part whatever, any attorneys in the audience, if you want to look it up, there it is. We are a business. And it's not to say that a business is bad. We're a social corporation. It's got to all work out. The rising tide has to raise all boats. So if you're looking at the land of the, your product, like a farmer looks at lands in a very economic way. The farmer only has a farm, and that's it. They're making an economic model about what to grow, right? So this is one of our crops. This is a building that we put retail, office, and residential. This is the streetscape project that Chris got pissed off about. So thank you, city. For the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and a street tree, that's awesome. We didn't pay for it. It's a subsidy at our front door, right? But we took this building from $300,000 to $11 million in value. So what happened is the tax bill just shot up 3,500%. That's not money we get. That's money you get. That's the community gets that taxes out of us, a 3,500% growth in taxes. Do you all have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500% or Christmas fund? And that's a good return on investment, right? So people are like, well, Joe, that's not fair. We got this Walmart over here. That Walmart's worth $20 million in taxes, right? 
this, this building pays $200,000 in property taxes, which is significant. This, this is my house. Those are my dogs. They think they're lions. Um, <laughs> We do that to freak our neighbors out, by the way. We pay $2,000 in taxes. We're on a tenth of an acre. So if a one-acre cookie cutter fell from space and hit my neighborhood, it'd pull $20,000 an acre in taxes, right? $2,000 a house, 10 houses, $20,000. You take that one-acre cookie cutter, fly in space, divide, put it on the Walmart, and divide its tax bill by the 34 acres it consumes, this is what you get. Now, if you had an acre of our building, this is what you get. So if you could harvest a crop, what kind of crop would you grow? If you could yield taxes, what kind of taxes would you want to have? A 6,000 an acre, 600,000, or 20,000? I was presenting this in Colorado. I was like, let me make it easier for you folks in Colorado. What crop would you grow? <laughs> I know this works here, too. Um, you know, you go for the cash crop, right? Now, in other states, not yours, Colorado in particular, it's run mostly off retail taxes at the local level. So we went ahead and measured that. Again, people look at that as the big bellwether. It's like, that's a lot of money, but the city gets a portion of a portion of that, or about 47,500. Add that to the property taxes, a total nut of 51,000. This is just our property taxes per acre. Now, we've got retail stuff here. Now you're cooking with gas, jobs per acre. You know, when you put them side by side, just let the numbers do the talking for you. What gives you the best return to your community? What gives you the best wealth? And there it is. We even have 90 units of residential per acre versus our zero. Could you imagine if I showed up and said, I'm going to do a 90 unit an acre building in your, in your downtown? Like, some of you might not like that. 90 units sounds a lot, but that's not that bad, right? That's an old JCPenney's department store. Sometimes people tell me, like, Joe, dude, what's your problem? Why do you hate Walmart? And you're missing my point if that's what you're taking from this. I, I presented at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers which is where all the assessors go. Any assessors in the room? Okay. Have you been to an, IAA, an IAO? Uh, yeah. yeah, it makes a planning conference look like Burning Man. It's like the, it's very, <laughs> it's very square. It's, I mean, no, no offense. I mean, just, these, are, these are uber nerds. These are people who are like talking like crazy calculus and stuff like this for an entire week. But this guy presented at the assessors conference at 8 in the morning. He's presenting how cheap a Walmart is. Like, our buildings are so cheap, and he hands out business cards. He's like, if you want our, if you want our, if you want our, our specs from our, business, our buildings, we'll share them with you. If you think we make Procter & Gamble inexpensive, you got to see what we do to our general contractors. We make the cheapest buildings possible. And the assessors are just taking notes, right? They're agnostic. They're like, whatever, if it's a piece of crap building, it's a piece of crap. Thank you, right? I'm in the back of the room with my heart collapsing because I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe he's doing this. This is awesome. He's getting all of his tax bills lowered in one meeting. That's brilliant. 2,000 assessors. Now, the architect in me was having a coronary because I'm just like, wait a minute. He's getting away with just doing cheap buildings like this and no one seems to care. So I went up to the microphone at this conference and I asked him, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? And he immediately shot back, 15 years. We'll be out of that building in 15 years. We designed that building on a depreciation cycle to depreciate as quick as possible and get into a new building because we're more interested in the distribution system. From the mouth of babes, folks. That's our tax policy. When you tax on property value, there's a perverse incentive to build junk, period. That's it. Doesn't that hurt when I say that? Yeah. You know, so I, I tell people, like, if, if you want a Walmart, just realize it's got the useful life of a cat. But at least we mourn the cat when the cat passes. This is the reality of our tax code. So that's the city side. Now, our, ta our county taxes in the south are more perverse than what you have here, but this is what we pay the average city resident pays in county taxes to the county versus somebody out in the county. And these are the folks that you know, call us a cesspool of sin and all that fun stuff. So we're like, how about a thank you card? We're giving you more taxes than what you're paying. Here's the mall versus residential. So commercial produces more taxes than residential. But let's not stop there. Here's the mall, here's our building in downtown and what it pays to the county. So what we find is what's good for the downtown is great for the city. It's unbelievable for the county. Because the county doesn't come in and do a streetscape project or build a dog park or any of that. But they're yielding all of this revenue. I want you to realize that this isn't complex math that I'm doing here. It's fifth grade division. It's productivity. It's understanding the productivity and cash yield or tax yield on your properties, right? We do this when we talk about cars. Could you imagine if we're all like out in the lobby over here having a beer and I start telling you about my truck and I get 650 miles per tank? Isn't that awesome? And you're going to be like, Joe, come on now, that's stupid. You've got a massive tank in that thing. 
It's not the tank that drives the car, it's the gallon within it. That's how we compare things. We say miles per gallon, and the numbers change, right? We should all be driving BMW Assettas at 70 miles per gallon. Sorry to the Prius owners, 1955 technology. You see what I'm talking about here? I'm making a joke here, but it's, we already do this with cars. Why don't we just do this with land? Land's more finite than gas is. You can't make another planet. I guess the gas is under that. So we've done this all across the country. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be in Maine or California. For every dollar of county taxes, somebody out in the county is paying to the county. Somebody inside the city is paying about five bucks to that same county. Here's the Walmart. Here's the mall. As soon as you get to a two-story building, this could be in Driggs, Idaho, where the whole entire county that's like the size of Vermont is like 2,000 people, or downtown Durham. As soon as you start stacking stories, you're stacking your dollar bills. And what's crazy, it's not a proportional growth, it's an exponential growth. And this isn't to say go off and build skyscrapers. I'm just showing you what a six-story building does. You can fit a lot of those in the community. So how do you show this to people? How do you get people to see it? If I can map your brain and show you the data of what's going on in your brain, can we do the same with the city? Can we take the city and can we move the city out of the way? And can we do things like with typical GIS technology? Any GIS nerds in the audience? Um, you know, it's like we, we work in layers, right? You've got infrastructure. You've got buildings built on the infrastructure. And you can map your ologies. I can show you your hydrology, your geology, all that stuff. What we like to do is separate nature and the man-made and map the policies. Can I show you your economics of what's going on as a layer? Can I, can I give you that CAT scan? So here's Asheville. Here's my county. Um, this is non-taxable, so this is part of the Blue Ridge Parkway that comes through town, so this is a big federal park. So just to be cold about it, I don't care about it, it's not paying taxes, right? 100% non-taxable, just gray. This is the Biltmore Estate. This is America's largest house. Very, very valuable. It's worth $100 million, one house. Anybody have a $100 million house in here? Now, it's not fair because it's a 150,000 square foot house sitting on 4,000 acres of land. This is the biggest gas tank in my entire community. So rather than look at things by like, oh yeah, that's powerful. When the, when the, when the Cecils, the owners of this house, show up on, at a, county, at a com commission meeting, we all genuflect and, and thank them for their time. I mean, they're important people, right? But it's, it's a misrepresentation of the potency. So rather than a total value, this is a value per acre map, and here it is in 3D. I'll make it easy. Can you all tell where downtown Asheville might possibly be? Take a wild guess. Boom, right? Now what we can also see inside our county, which is 350 square miles, we can see our little sister over here of Black Mountain. 10 miles away, you can see it's downtown there too. Much like that's mama bear, this is baby bear. A little smaller version of that. You know, we can see what's going on with the data. Um, we find weird things in communities. This is West Palm Beach, Florida. Here's downtown. You find things like this, where this is a little building on Main Street that's actually more potent than that, two, two blocks away. I love that they call this building the Darth Vader building. But basically, 2.3 acres of this would equal the 2.6 acre of that. That's the math. They'd actually be better off with a few of these than that thing. Um, it was also fun that, I don't know if y'all are Trump supporters here, but um, we, pu <laughs> we pulled all of his property. There's Mar-a-Lago. This is his summer, winter retreat or whatever. So the Donald's worth about $400,000 of, of property value per acre, right? Well, this is one of the poorest neighborhoods in all of West Palm Beach, these shotgun shacks are pulling 618,000 per acre versus his 400. You know, it's like you can find things like this that are hiding in plain sight. It's just like, what's up with that? Um, retail sales, uh, again, your state, it barely matters. Colorado, it's really important. This is at a local level. Property taxes, retail taxes, and these are like transfers that come from the state and such. So green is retail. If you look at you guys over here, you're mostly property taxes, which is good. That means you control most of the decisions at a local level with your, with your zoning. That's great. Just be aware of that. But when you do look at retail taxes, again, we see the same picture. This is Durango, Colorado, 26,000 people. This is their property tax model. Um, this is where their mall and Walmart and all that stuff's down here. Um, this is the retail sales. Again, their little downtown's killing it. Their downtown's half the size of yours, maybe even a quarter size of yours. Um, and it's like, it's like 12 blocks. Um, this is the total productivity, and here's the jobs. Um, so we did things like map downtown to South Durango. So overall, South Durango wins in aggregate retail taxes. It's winning in county taxes aggregate. But the land area, it's not fair because downtown's only one-third the size, yet it's almost as productive. So we told them, like, look, just find 8.3 more acres of downtown, a couple parking lots, and, and grow it up. You'll catch up to your taxes. 
Um, is this all too nerdy for you all? Is this, this good? Uh, these are, this is called an area graph of downtown South Durango and the other layers. But let's just look at downtown versus South Durango. Before the recession, so here's where the recession happened, downtown was about 86% of South Durango. Through the recession, it grew up um, to be about 91%. So we thought, okay, maybe it's all these new infill buildings that downtown was adding versus South Durango. So we measured it. This is what downtown added. This is what South Durango was adding during that same period. Did y'all get that? 300,000 square feet of big box stuff was being added, and that little piece was catching up to that. So pound for pound, dollar for dollar, they were building aggregate wealth with small buildings. So we asked, could we just measure that? So we got a couple of businesses to actually open their books. Uh, Tim and Peter, Tim, owns, Tim Callahan owns the uh, coffee shop, two one-story buildings. Peter Sh uh, Shaler works, or, or Tim, uh, Shirts owns the bookstore. So here's the footprint difference. Here's the property tax productivity difference. So those two little businesses were producing $22,000 an acre in county taxes versus the Walmart at about $2,000. Um, this is the retail sales of those little businesses. Again, a coffee shop and a bookstore versus Walmart. Retail taxes per acre, jobs. So we see that these small businesses are much more potent than the big, big box stuff. The data is there, just measure it. Now you can ask the other qualitative questions. On which side of this ledger, here or over here, who is hiring the local attorney? Who is hiring the local accountant? Who's sponsoring the Little League team? Who's on that community board to help with the planning commission or the downtown public art fund or whatever, right? These are decisions to help grow your wealth in your community, but also build that social fabric, and the wealth is there to prove it. Just measure it. So uh, we find weird, this is another weird thing. This is uh, Redlands, California. It's like the eastern edge of, it's home to Jack Dangerman and Esri. So this is like right in his backyard. It was kind of fun. And we asked everybody, what's this, build, what's this building right there? And everybody thought it was this thing. This is in downtown. This is the tallest building in downtown. We're like, well, no, actually that tall purple spike is this thing. A little two-story building. Who would have thought? Again, let the data tell you the story. Don't let your biases get into it. So this little shoe shop right here, if you had three acres of that thing, it would equal a 12-acre Walmart. Right? That's the data. Um, they had this dead mall in the downtown that, like, they blew out part of the downtown and did this mall. Um, so we went ahead and went back into the Sanborn maps and, like, reproduced the city. Like, let's just pretend it never happened. So here's all the buildings that they tore down. So here's what happened. There's the mall. So current value is about $5.6 million for the mall. If they no never tore the buildings down, this is where they'd be. So let that, look, look at that for a second. They essentially threw away, even if the mall was in great shape, it'd only be about $10 million. So they threw away essentially 20, uh, $11 million of value. Just threw it away because we didn't learn that lesson from our past. We didn't know what cities were and how they operated. Um, in a way, it's like we need to make America great again and just kind of hit the reset button on urban renewal, right? That's a joke. <laughs> so um, you might be wondering by now, well, that's good, Joe. What, that's all the revenue side. What about the cost? How much does this stuff cost? We did this project in Lafayette, Louisiana with Chuck Marone from Strong Towns. And um, I don't know if you all know Chuck's work, but he gets into the costing side of this. He's an engineer. And when we started working with this, this city, um, and I'm, I'm seriously not making this up. The mayor's like, look, Joe, we're broke. People don't understand how broke we are. You need to show them how broke we are. So we're like, we dig into their books. This is the cover of their budget document from 1992. Do you think the finance officer was sending a message about the state of affairs with the government? So this tsunami's going to take the government down, and the shark was going to eat it. Now, what do you think the county officials did when faced with this data? kick the can down the road, hope that it all disappears the next year. The next year, undeterred, the finance officer was like, hey, did I mention how screwed we are? <laughs> the third year, they did this joint city-county government. And so I asked him, I said, that was 20 years ago. In the 20 years since, when you used your city to bail out your county, what did you do to change your pattern? Because now your city's broke, too. It just took 20 years to sink that one. How did you change your behavior? You didn't. You just continued the same sprawl in the same low, low wealth development pattern, and now you're broke again. What a surprise. So here's their county. This is downtown. Here's some new urbanism stuff, and they generally spread in two directions. Just taking stuff like pavement. You all are shareholders in your community, and you own roads. When I, as a developer, build a road and give it to your community, I'm giving you a liability that's 40 years down the road. 40 years from now, you're going to have to fix that. 
It's yours. It's not mine. You have to plow it every year, all that stuff, right? If you take all of their roads and you shove them together, it's a, it's a six and a half square mile parking lot. This is floating over New Orleans. We just had to give them a picture of how big this was. This is a lot of, a lot of surface area. Um, when we showed them all of this, one of the counselors, it was really kind of funny, he said, it's not about where you live, it's about what you believe, right? <laughs> all right, I believe I look like Brad Pitt. Sooner or later, I gotta walk by a mirror, right? Um, the public works director responded to this statement by saying this, there's no such thing as an infrastructure ferry. <laughs> Uh, so we, we photoshopped Kevin in on this one to kind of drive the point home. And Kevin's right. He's like, look, can you just show it to them differently? I'm like, sure. So in 19, 2015, we did the study. 2009, they stopped taking roads in. But in 1960, when that developer gave you that suburban development, that little red brick right there is what you should have set into a banking account to pay for that roads replacement every single year until 2010. And then this is the cost of that road replacement. Right? But the problem is in 1961, you took on more roads, 1962 more roads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then here's where you are is a liability pent up. This is your revenue up here in blue. Here's how you're going to be cycling forward. If you're already feeling pain, it's not going to get any better. So let me ask you a question. Do you have enough blue to pay for the red? Let me make it easier. Do you have enough blue to pay for the red? So the, the liability is 18 times the revenue. Now here's the scary part. They already started going broke, so what did they do? They went out to the bond market. They asked for more money. They're essentially going out, taking out loans. So that when they do that, when you make a commitment to a bond market, they got first right of refusal of your taxes. So they take half of that of what comes in the door. So you're only really playing with 25 million of taxes. Is that depressing? Have you guys run these numbers in your community? Do you know what you owe? Do you know what you're worth? So this is like looking at the city like a battleship. We sent everybody a bill. Into, so that's all the stuff in the ground. This is what it costs for you to live wherever you're living. This is the revenues of what pays for the taxes, right? So you net one against the other. What's in the black and what's in the red? Here's the whole thing in 3D. If you took this thing and just dropped it on the floor, this is what it looks like. So we can see what's net negative versus what's net positive, right? And they told us, so like, well, people really want to live out here and out here. And I said, yeah, that's what you're paying them to move out there. This isn't about what you want. This is about what you can afford, right? This is what it costs for those people to live there. Charge them. You know, I want to be six foot tall and have a full head of hair. I think you all should pay for that. That'd make me happy. Is this about happiness? Is it about what you can afford as a community? So to make it real simple, in 1950, they had 34,000 people, five feet of pipe per person, 2.4 fire hydrants per thousand. They've grown their population to 121,000. They've grown their liability, their pipe, to this per person, and this is their fire hydrants per thousand. So they've grown their people 350%, they've grown their liability 1,000 and 2,000%. And the whole time they told us, like, Joe, we got rich, we got gas money out of the Gulf, we made lots of money. I'm like, all right, we can measure that. So they were indeed poor back in the 1950s, and they've grown their wealth. That's only 160% growth of revenue, it's a 2,000% growth of liability. This makes no sense. But this has become our paradigm of how we develop American cities, that we have this hopeful, wishful future of buying something that we can't afford because it makes us happy today. You're all living with this. You're living with these decisions from the 50s and 60s that you have to pay for now. Am I making you feel bad yet? <laughs> it's going to get worse. So this is uh, South Bend, Indiana. Just their pipes. This is the apex of South Bend, Indiana, home of Notre Dame. Their best year ever was 1963. That's when they lost Studebaker and Packard to Detroit, and then they flatlined. This is their population. On the right is their pipe growth. When they're building a community, they're adding pipe. I'm going to go ahead and drop a boundary when their population stops. So they're, they're growing, adding infrastructure, adding people, and right about here is when their population stops. Can you afford that? If you're not adding more people, why are you adding more pipe? What's going to happen to your kids when they want to come back to town or when they want to live there? Are they going to be able to afford all this infrastructure that you bought? You know, so indexing their pipe growth against their population growth, this is what it looks like. And I was like, were you all dying of thirst in 1930 that you needed that much more pipe or something? Like, what's up with that? Stretched end for end, their pipe will go from South Bend, Indiana to my office in Asheville. You bought it. Good luck with that. So. Peoria, we did a, this is like a, a CAT scan of the land use. So we've got vegetation, water, we've got streets and sidewalks. This is their parking. 
They got a lot of parking. It was funny that they told me I had a parking problem. I was like, oh yeah, you got a problem. Um, <laughs> here's your buildings. So um, just looking at the buildings and the parking, so the way that cities work as a transaction is that, as the assessor knows, you value the private use of the, the improvements to the property, right? So we have, you've improved it with a parking lot or a building. Those have costs to it, right? So we've got, we had to make this uh, analysis relevant to Peoria, so we had to speak their language. They make Caterpillar, so we had to put a Caterpillar in here. Um, so you've got buildings, these are your improvements. Your, your, your buildings are worth about 35 bucks a square foot. Your parking's worth a buck 50. So the problem is you've got this street over here, doesn't care how you use the land. Your street costs about nine bucks a linear foot, or in their, in their community. So if this is $9 a linear foot, which one of these is carrying the freight of the cost of the infrastructure? Well, it's not this. Another way of thinking about it, when we talk about subsidies, we tend to think of it in a very conscious act. I, as a developer, come in, I'm going to build a 12-story building near downtown. You all yell at me, call me a land rapist or whatever you want to call me, and how I'm going to destroy your community. And then I walk out the door with this zoning bonus, right? That's a subsidy. It's true. But if you tax me 1 30th for doing this versus this, that's indeed a subsidy too. Let's call it that. Let's be fair. So when you look at the model, the reason why the model drops off is because there's a choker of parking all around the downtown that drops the model down. That's how you lose your value. Or when you look at the suburbs, the reason why it's so flat is because it's mostly parking. It's really simple, if you think about it. There's a subsidy baked in for me to underutilize your real estate. And I get all this infrastructure for free, basically. So we took the whole county and just did the CAT scan of the county to say, OK, what's buildings? What's parking? Here's the whole entire county. Um, there's the buildings. If you just shove them together, that's the land you only need. But you wanted to spread it out because you want to have space, right? You want to have parking lots and drive around and have a car. All right, well, that's your parking that you need. You actually need more parking for your community than buildings. And then this stuff, you owe money on. Those are your streets. So you have 8.6 square miles of buildings, 9 square miles of parking, 12 square miles of, of roads, and this is everything else. Berms, buffers, backyards, parks, farms, whatever. These are the values of all of them. Now on a per square mile basis, these are the numbers. This is an easier way to see it. So if you have to spend $250 million a year, and should be in the reserve account for all of your streets, which one is actually filling that fund? Is it the parking? No. Certainly isn't this stuff. That's what's carrying the weight. So it's a huge liability and burden that we're putting on these buildings to carry all that extra infrastructure and we're not penciling it out. So we end up in this really weird thing that we're, we're, we're actually going after bigger and bigger buildings because we're so far upside down financially without ever measuring the stuff that's driving us upside down financially. Their roads would be a four-lane road from Peoria to Salt Lake or if you did a two-lane road, it'd go all the way to Vancouver. They have to fix all of this stuff. So when we talk about our budget, and we don't have money for the Greenway, the art teacher, the dancing traffic cop, you guys probably do have a dancing traffic cop, don't you? No? <laughs> it's because it's tied up in this pattern. And you see it around every community. It's habits that we've developed. You know, we didn't, we didn't emerge from the savannah in suburbia. This is a pattern that we've built in our community. Um, Charleston is one of our favorite st cities to study. It's really old. Um, so we grabbed all the buildings that predate the Declaration of Independence. You all understand old buildings here. Um, so there's the date. Here's the buildings. This is the oldest liquor store in the entire country, built in 1686. There's a revolutionary right there. Um, here's the buildings. So there's about 21 acres of those buildings. Last year, what they paid the county was uh, $600,000. That's what they wrote to the county as taxes. Here's the Walmart. It's 21 acres. This is what they paid to the county. This is the reality of the information right there. So all this stuff is kind of simple to measure. It's right there. Just open the books. You've got to do the things that are measurable. So what about you guys? So uh, y'all pulled a contract together to just pick a few properties, so we grabbed some. Here's your Walmart at about half a million an acre. Here's Bed Bath & Beyond. That's doing all right right now, but this is, let me take a wild guess. Is this newer than that? Okay, this will eventually depreciate to that. And the bellwether is this. You can see what happens the longer it sits around, the more that it goes down in value. That's the reality of the typology of these buildings. It's designed a certain way financially. Um, the University Mall at 800,000. This is Maple Tree Place. Not so bad because there's probably you know, second story buildings here, so you're getting more value in that. Um, but here's your downtown mall, currently pulling about 9 million in value per acre. So it's killing this. Um, you get into some things like this. This is 700,000. This little house, we just grabbed somebody's random. I hope this isn't anybody in the room. We just 
grab that little random house right there, $2 million of value per acre. Again, the Walmart's half a million. This guy right here is $3 million. These little townhouses on, I think that's Maple Street. Um, these guys, they're killing it. Now, I'm not gonna, as an architect, I'm not going to say these are absolute gems of architecture. I mean, they could be better designed at the ground level, um, but still, big buildings, big value, right? 53 million, let's say 54 million an acre, 45, again, the Walmart's half a million. Um, over in Winooski, there's some cool things going on. This is old Winooski, like 6 million value per acre. Uh, we call this the Winooski Donut because it's a donut building around a parking lot on the inside, but um, no offense to anybody who worked on that building, but it's, it's kind of low, but it's probably because there might be a tax increment deal or something like that, but it's still double the Walmart value, and this thing's going to be there for a long time. It's not going to be gone in 15 years. And then this is the mill conversion at $3 million in Winooski. Your heritage buildings are awesome. You know this. They're giving, paying you in spades. So if you're, there's your mall. This is the uh, Lake Champlain Chocolate just right adjacent to that building at $11 million of value per acre. Um, this guy here, 65, means $0.18 million an acre. Um, and then one of my favorite buildings, this thing, the old Masonic Lodge, at $12 million. And this building has been sitting around here for over 100 years, producing that high level of value, right? This is something to be proud about architecturally, but also financially. Um, the Richardson, there it is, built between 1896-ish. Here it is on a postcard with your street trolley. There it is today at about $5 million. Um, and then this is the big breadwinner. There's a horse in the picture when it was built. And this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight stories tall. So in the last 100 years, have you increased the scale of your city? Past beyond eight years? Yes, you are, but can you do better than that? But this is the value of this thing over 100 years. So basically, if you had um, a little under an acre of this stuff, it would equal the 18-acre Walmart in value. If you had, if you literally added five feet to this building, five feet, if you added five feet to that, it would equal the two acre mall in value. If you had a half, a little bit over a half an acre of this would equal the 41 acre university mall. Apples to apples, folks. This is the math. Um, I love this. Four acres of that would equal the 64 acre of this. That's kind of amazing, 64 acres. What's the, what's the size of your downtown? Do you all know how many acres? It's probably like, what, 150, 200 acres? This thing's like half the size of downtown. Half an acre of that would equal the 16-acre Lowe's. Um, one, let's say two acres of this guy would equal the 11-acre Kmart. This could be a start of a conversation. The Kmart's not going to be here forever. Could you do two acres of this stuff on this site and maybe add a one of these guys in there or something like that. How do you cultivate your wealth and do it in a way that adds value to your community and works with the property owner so it's a win-win situation? Do what's good for your community. You know, grow yourself in. Um, and just, I want you to realize there's really, really weird things that happen inside the, the tax models um, and just realize that they're there and don't be surprised. Um, I was at the assessor's conference for this. Taking the, the buildings and throwing them away and just looking at the dirt value per acre, just the dirt per acre, you expect the world to look like this. Everybody in the neighborhood's got the same color, right? The, the same value per acre right there, right? But when we were presenting this to the community, first of all, this should tell you something. When you start to see these wild anomalies, assessors don't do maps to double check their math, or generally speaking, they don't. They, they do calculus. They do like spreadsheets and all sorts of craziness, and they have a really hard job. They're trying to figure out how we behave as hairless apes in a marketplace. For those of us that have bought houses that are married, who, let me know if this sounds familiar. We bought our house to basically solve an argument between my wife and I. Does that sound familiar? Is that rational? We paid more money than what we needed to. So assessors have to go in and figure that out. Who paid too much, who paid too little, and what's the center of the marketplace? So we're showing this, we're like, what's going on here where this is $15,000 an acre, and as soon as you cross the street, it doubles in value. Same zoning category, same school district, same police district. How does, how does land double in value when they cross the street? I was presenting this in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and the assessor raised her hand. And she goes, you don't understand. I was like, try me. She goes, well, they have more land. The more land you have, the lower the value per acre. The mayor just about spat coffee out of his nose. He was laughing so hard. 
She's like, yeah, more land, lower value. And I was like, okay, so I've got three miles of streets around this property. This fellow's got 200 feet. She goes, yeah, we don't count infrastructure as part of the assessment value. So you're not counting any of our investment into the dirt that makes that dirt available. You're not including that into the value proposition? She goes, no, that's not our standard. Our standard is the more land you have, the lower the value. There are probably more trips here. More trips mean more car accidents, more fire calls. She goes, we don't count that either. It's our standard. So I was there at the assessor's conference to ask them. I'm like, where'd this standard come from? Did Moses deliver it to you? <laughs> and assessors are awesome. Their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. They take that very seriously. So I asked them, I said, how is this fair and how is it equitable? And they're like, it's not. And I'm, I'm seriously not making this up. I'm like, okay, if it's not fair and equitable, where'd it come from? They're like, we don't know. You need to talk to Larry Clark. So I tracked this guy, Larry Clark, down in the hallway and I show him this. He thought this was hilarious, by the way. And and I said, where'd this come from? He's like, well, it's probably have to do something with the 1700s, something about agricultural policy, and I don't know, we probably should change it. <laughs> These aren't invisible market forces, folks. <laughs> These are policies. Uh, this is the tax system in Normandy. You were taxed on your building footprint for 100 years, and people started figuring out how to project out over the street. And then buildings started catching on fire because they're too close to each other, so they changed the tax code. In England, you were taxed progressively on the number of windows you had. The more windows, the more shillings you paid. And people started boarding up the windows. They threw the tax system out after that. France, anything below your roof line was considered your building. Anything above it was considered your roof. There was no design guideline in Paris that made this happen. This is the tax code that caused that. This is clearly the roof, right? Tax-free. So know where your policies hurt you. Know what's going on in your community and realize these are yours. This stuff is your stuff. You know, it's ironic that we're a country that was formed on a tax revolt and we're the most illiterate tax people on the planet. Know this stuff. It's kind of, I kind of miss him. Um, <laughs> but in a way, you know, he kind of missed the target. We're not addicted to oil. We're addicted to this suburban pattern. We're addicted to not having a neighbor. I don't want somebody walking around above me. You know, and it's a pattern that we've built into a system. And we're just now realizing the cost of that. It just took us 50 years to figure that out. And I'm not the first person to come on to this. Actually, the Nixon administration in 1973 published this document, The Cost of Sprawl. We can thank Tricky Dick for this. You know, we have the data. We just have to apply it. You know, your accountant, if you just put this stuff on the ground and map it, your accountant doesn't care if you can afford a boat. Or, or if you buy a boat, your accountant cares if you can afford the boat, right? Go out and buy one if you can afford it. So these are critical facts that we have to face. This is our generation's challenge to dealing with this stuff, and we have to be aware that we are now impregnated with biases. Just a show of hands, who grew up in multifamily product in this audience? Three people, four people. Most of us have a bias built into us. We think that this is natural. If you look at the scale of human civilization, it's not. Your downtowns are your golden gooses right now. They're supporting your communities. They're keeping your communities afloat. When you have the majority of it at this low density sprawl that's driving you broke, you have to reward your golden goose. You have to feed it. You have to grow it. Um, I was looking forward to going to White River Junction. This is a postcard from the uh, early 1900s. Do they have this going on there? You know, it's just, you know, it's just, as we look toward the future, we have to be aware of our own naivete. Driverless cars isn't going to solve this problem, folks. You know, it's going to be looking at the math and figuring out how to keep ourselves physically prudent. We also have to be open and willing to change. This is a shot of, of Church Street from 1860, and here it is in 2010. Some of the buildings that you cherish and love are actually intruders into this environment, right? So be aware of that, do your math, and build a great community. Thank you. So we have, we have time for questions. Um, I went a little over, but I'm going to go ahead and fire away. Is that too nerdy for you all? Are you good with that? And the question is, in summary, what I'm suggesting is build up and denser. Well, first, in summary, I think my first point would be do your measurements. You know, I want to know your body mass index, your, 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 your blood platelet counts. Get all of your data first and then have that conversation. You know, it's not, some people, um, 
where was I? I was in Driggs, Idaho. They're like, what you're telling us we need to do here is stack people in like Mar Manhattan. And I was like, dude, I never said that. Look, um, I don't care what you do with your life. I just care that you're doing your measurements. Um, but also, some people will choose that product. So just do it in a way that adds value to your community. You know, you already have folks buying housing downtown, but do it in a way that it adds value to the downtown so you're not killing the ground floor. So y'all all are doing that. You're talking about form-based code and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, it's, I mean, put simply, density, design, and height add value, but that's not saying build skyscrapers everywhere. You can do those, those three-story townhouses. We're killing it at $3 million an acre. The question is, have I seen anybody translate this into public documents? Yes, every, every city has taken this in different ways. I mean, if you think about it, we're a room full of humans. At, at that scale, we're all the same. But when you put you and I like side by side, you start to see the differences. When you start asking about our genealogy, our age, our history, we're very different. What I find with cities is they're collections of people, and they're all different depending on where we go. So that oftentimes, I don't, I don't have a... You know, here, here are the things you need to do. First, we start with your data, and then you start adjusting based on where you are. You know, some, your community's been eating a lot more salad than Gwinnett County, Georgia has, right? So you're in a better spot, and you do your adjustments. So you might need to do a little bit of yoga, um, where Gwinnett County needs to just put the hamburger down. <laughs> that makes sense? Um, uh, Lafayette, this is totally unsexy, but Lafayette, um, one of the failures, any finance officers in the room? Um, one of the reasons why they didn't keep track of their problem in Lafayette is because of a standard. Um, finance officers follow, follow this group called the um, Government Finance Officers Association, the GFOA. They have these standards called CAFR standards, much in the way that you guys have CAMA models at the assessors conference, so at the assessors world. So planners have their own standards. Everybody's got standards, right, inside their bureaucracies. One of the weird standards inside finance is that roads are considered assets, right? So my computer is an asset. My computer depreciates. But I can sell that computer to you. We can't pick the roads up and sell them to Albany. This is not going to happen. So we asked them, we're like, well, you can't pick your roads up. Why are they assets? She's like, that's our standard. They've always been that way. So they're invisible to the books for most politicians. You see your revenues, your expenses, and you have this thing called assets. And when you look at it, you're like, wow, look at all these great roads we have. It's like, well, it's all a huge liability. So in, in our world, in real estate development, when we put an air conditioner on top of a building, we know that that air conditioner is going to fail probably in 15 years. And we know it's going to cost us probably like $20,000 or whatever for a whole building. And we don't have $20,000 just sitting in our pocket. So what we do is we put a little bit of rent away every single month that goes into a, a, a sunk fund. So that 15 years from now, when that collapse happens, we can go to the bank account and pay for a new equipment. Cities don't do that with roads. So the roads become these kind of things that pop up all, all of a sudden, like we need to replace a road, and, and that becomes a problem. We don't have the reserves built for it. Most cities don't. So it's not all that sexy to say they built, they're doing a reserve account. They're changing their CAFR standards, and that's what's going on. Everything's going to be different in every community. Sir? Um, there's, there's a couple of uh, good studies on that. Um, you know, so the question is, how do you value your social infrastructure, like your libraries? Um, you know, we haven't, we haven't been set on that path by any of our clients yet to go down that road. Uh, we could pull that and find that. What we find is um, there's, I, I use this analogy, but I've started to realize a lot of audiences don't know this, but there's this kids game where you have like a jar and you put rocks in it and you give like a bunch of rocks to a kid and see if they can fit all the rocks in the jar and the kids go through this test putting the, the, the small rocks in or the medium rocks but what they find is the only way to get the rocks into the jar is you put the big ones in first, put the medium ones in, you shake it, put the smaller ones in, shake it and then they'll all fit. So there's an order that you have to put them in. 
what we find with the, with the community infrastructure like libraries, affordable housing, that kind of stuff, it yields social dividends on the community. But if you're not paying attention to the big rocks first and to see how faulty they are, this stuff doesn't matter. It's like you need to do your foundation before you deal with your roof. If you have cracks in your foundation, it doesn't matter if you put a solar panel up there. The house is going to fall down. So we start down at the big rocks. We start at the pipes, the roads, that kind of stuff. Um, there's a great book by Charles Montgomery. Uh, it's called Happy City. Um, I recommend that to a lot of folks. They actually measure the social value, the social consequences of just meeting on the street. There's scientists that have done this to figure out the benefits to our happiness and our social uh, well-being. Um, and, and those interactions actually make us better communities. They make us happier when we meet people on the street and talk, the little interactions. That's all measurable. You can measure that stuff. Um, how do you, well, you can't reach everybody. You know, it's a, the best you can do is put information out there. And I'm going to give you an example in the opposite world, uh, which is Gwinnett, this is going to be quick, uh, Gwinnett County, Georgia. Who's heard of Gwinnett County, Georgia, by the way? Yeah, a few folks. So Lawrenceville is the county seat. I had never heard of Lawrenceville. I'm four hours away. And I was under strict orders when I went down there that I wasn't allowed to say four words. I wasn't allowed to say the word urban, city, town, or municipal during the presentation. Now, my company's called Urban 3. It's a little hard not to say that, but I was like, fine, whatever you want. They said, we're rural people. We just, those are offensive to us. We're outside the beltway of Atlanta. We're not city people. This is our county. And we ran their numbers. There are 812,000 people in the county. And I called up my client, and she's like, yeah, but honey, we're 460 square miles. We're huge. I was like, all right, I don't know what that means. So, but density is the people divided into the square miles. You take 800,000 divided into 460, it's 1,900 people per square mile, which is less dense than Atlanta. But we had all this other data, so I put it up there for them. And I was like, look, y'all are... 200 people per square mile denser than Mecklenburg. What's in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina? And somebody in the room goes, Charlotte? And I was like, yeah. And this is Nashville. You're 600 people denser than them. Both of them have a professional football team. There's no such thing as the Gwinnett County Cowboys, is there? This is Austin. You're double the density of Austin, Raleigh, Asheville. This is what rural looks like. This is Chapel Hill, North Carolina. What did you do? And so, we did their model, and as Josh McCarty was doing it, I was like, Josh, turn it on its side. It, it looks like a 1970s shag carpet. It's like the same <laughs> thing across the whole thing. They basically built, that's the last farm right there. The entire county is monolithically sprawl. And that, that's it. So this is what we typically see. This is the reason why we were freaked out when we saw the model. This is Orange County. I can see Chapel Hill, Carborough, and Hillsborough. I can see Main Street, Main Street, Main Street, New Urbanism. The model's showing us the data. I'm like, this is what you got. So the highest value per acre is right there. That's the most potent building in your entire community. All of these places are less dense. This is the most potent building in the entire county. And your great-grandparents left it for you from 1910, uh, this bank. So this is an economic heart monitor of the three counties of Nashville, Austin, and Lawrenceville. And we pulsed out their, uh, their, their value. So we've got a peak value of 192 million here, 476, and 8 million there. As I was presenting that night to the community, and I had to go do a private presentation the night before the actual presentation to stakeholders, and it was all the elected officials, and I had the cognitive dissonance, where this one counselor was like, but we're not urban. I'm like, ma'am, I never called you urban. You know, I said, look, 40% of your, or the realtors would say 30% of your population would choose an urban product if you built it. You chose not to let that happen in your community. And let's say the realtors are 200% wrong. They don't understand real estate. What's 10% what's of 800,000 people? And she said 80,000. I said, that's Asheville. You should have had an Asheville by now. But you chose not to do it. And she kept going. She's like, we're not urban. And then at that point, I knew what she was talking about. I was like, all right. And this is kind of the hard part, I guess, between us chickens. I'm sorry that this is on tape, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. Um, I grew up up north. This is a racial thing. And so I was just like, all right, I don't care to ever work here ever again. I'm just going to be honest about it. 40% or 40 of their population is Hindi, Hispanic, or Asian. Another 20% are African American. You're looking at 60% of your population are people of color. And I turned to her and I said, look, ma'am, all these people in the room, I only see white people. 60% of your population are people of color. 
who is this we we're talking about? And she's like, but we're not urban. I'm like, ma'am, I never called you urban. I called you dense. You know, this is, <laughs> this is, the, this is the reality. You're, you're not going to reach everybody, but there are other people in the audience. They got it. You know, it's just, there are people that live in a fantasy land. And sorry, you've got to start with the data. Let's work through it. You're either going to come along with us and be part of this. This is a civic conversation. This is Civics 101. We all have to work together. You know, you can't just take your toys and go home. So I don't know. I mean, it's, in Asheville, we've got this one counselor that has turned the agenda of our community into a downtown park for six years now, even though we can't afford the two parks that we already have in our downtown. And it's great. Yeah, I want to have a park. I, I want to have cotton candy. I want to have a lot of things. Uh, but there's things that we are a priority, like affordable housing, um, our energy system. Our buses only work once an hour, which is unbelievably bad. Why a park? You know, so it's just, we have the same awkward conversations, I guess. Was that too off track? Anybody else? Sir? Well, the hard part about affordability is, uh, you know, we're a private developer, so we don't have access to tax credits and things like that. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was real easy. When we first did that, uh, that this uh, J.C. Penney's building here, um, those were affordable at one point in time. You know, we sold them to people for a, a, what we felt was a, a fair profit at our end. We had to take that money and go off and do another project. Um, you know, I, I, will, I will say this, just uh, the, the, the top salary in our company is $80,000 a year, you know, and that, but we get this kind of attitude from people in our community that you're some, you know, I'm wearing a suit. You know how much the suit cost me? 40 bucks. You know, I bought it at a J. Crew outlet, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's a performance costume. Um, I might as well wear a clown suit. There, but people have this attitude that, that you're a developer, you're making money, I want some of that. And I'm like, I'm sorry, do we have a little money mill back in our office where we just print money? You know, we sold those units for a very marginal profit. This, this housing that we're doing um, in this project, you know how hard it is to do that? We're getting a 3% return on those, on those housing units. Now, that if, if you want to have fun, go out and look at other investment vehicles and see where you could get more than 3%, like mutual funds. You know, we could go out and invest in a Walmart somewhere. I mean, there's lots of things we could do and make more money. And um, think about the fact that we don't have money in our pockets where we can just pull out $6 million to get this project done either. So we have to go to a bank and try to explain to them, yeah, we're going to get 4%, 3%, maybe, you know? What do you think a bank's going to say? You're crazy. Or we want to go to the local market and go find some doctors to help invest in our project. And we're like, hey, you want to make 3%? Wouldn't that be awesome? Join us? You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't fly. What was amazing about this project when we first started this, um, I was actually designing a building on this parcel right here, and we kept on getting hounded by hotel developers that wanted to do hotels with us. And they're like, just sell us land. We'll do a hotel. And we're like, no, it doesn't work that way. So we went down to the city, or I, I went on the zoning code, pulled out the downtown master plan. The downtown master plan called for building a joint venture public-private parking garage, right? So it was in the master plan. So we said to the hotel developer, we're like, okay, your 
you're private, we're private, let's go down to public and work together and let's work out this legal agreement that's going to be 40 pages. I made this cartoon because the document was so ridiculous. But we wanted to show the community that you own this garage, we're going to buy air rights above you, it's our land, we're going to essentially give the land into the project and then you're going to own and build the garage and we're going to pay you to drive in it. It took us four years to get the city to sign the contract. One of my friends is a city planner said to me, she goes, God, Joe, that just moved right along. It only took four years to get the contract signed. <laughs> and like, this is a friend of mine. I'm like, Sasha, do you know how many children my wife and I could produce in four years? Five. We could make five people. In the time it took you to sign a contract on something that was in your master plan, could you maybe see why developers wouldn't want to work with you guys? You know, so we have to keep this in, in conscience. We had to lay people off. I got laid off during the project, and we just don't have money sitting around. This stuff has to cash flow. So what I find with, you know, if, if there's one thing that could happen, there needs to be a dialogue on both sides of the fence. People in government need to spend some time in the, in the development world and understand how it operates. Conversely, people in, private, in development need to understand how government works. So I used to sit with my boss and talk with him about this because he would, like, lose his brains over this stuff. And it was all like the city this and the city that, the city this. I was like, have you ever worked in government? I remember the day that I decided I was quitting government. This guy was yelling at me. Um, it was like 8.30 in the morning. I was somehow destroying his life. And um, I had taken enough. And I turned to him. I said, Tony, see the guy over there? He's my 9 o'clock. When you're done yelling at me, he's going to come in. And this is going to go on all day long about how I destroyed your world. I made all these zoning laws and all this other stuff that's making your life hell. And this is going to go on until 5 o'clock when you people leave me alone so I can get my work done until 8 o'clock at night. Do you, th do you think this is a good existence for me? And he goes, dude, that's depressing. I'm like, yeah, welcome to government. So we, we tend to have this conspiracy that government's out to like control everybody's world. But if anybody's worked in government, it's hard enough to get the photocopier to work. You know, there's no conspiracy to, to do anything. So I, it's a long story, but I think there needs to be more dialogue across the sides. Think of it this way. Government has to be the judge on development to, to get this project through. And sometimes they'll put some great statements out there. This needs to be a public-private venture. It's like, great, if you write that down, make sure you know what you're talking about. You know, because don't drag us four years through a process so that we're teaching you this. Um, think of it this way. If you were a figure skater, would you respect the judges that never laced up a pair of skates? And that's the, that's the development review process. Developers have to do this all the time. Some of them want to do the right thing. You just have to help facilitate that path in the process. Anybody else? Yeah, there's... Yeah, so the questions about our, the comments about um, where have I seen alternative development. Uh, shipping containers are good. They're, they're hard to retrofit. Um, they're cheap. They're like $10,000 a box. But then they're, they're just steel. So you have to put some insulation on them somewhere. They're also kind of short. Um, that's usually the hurdle for a lot of folks, but there are people that are doing prefab, stackable, multifamily. Oftentimes they run afoul with, with building codes. There's, um, you know, a lot of building codes are determined by fire safety issues. And if you talk to most people that work in fire safety, my brother's a firefighter, he's like perpetually paranoid that every building is going to spontaneously combust when you put two people together. Um, yet somehow these buildings that don't have any sprinkling system in the downtown have been here for 100 years and no one's like died of a collapse in them. So you have fire codes that tend to make things more difficult um, for new construction that drives up the price. You know, it's always realized there's always a, an unintended consequence in, in things that we wish for. Um, and that has a, a cost effect. So the price of buildings, the reason why affordability is an issue, I'll make it real simple. The, reason, the biggest reason why land's af unaffordable is because I can hold one of those surface parking lots forever in your downtown and you're going to be taxing me on how I'm using it, not what its potential is. In Canada, they actually change that around. Um, have you all ever heard of Henry George? A couple. Um, Henry George was a tax economist in the 1800s. And I think he was in Philadelphia and lived part-time in Boston or something. But um, his concept was to... Uh, remove the building as part of the tax consequence. Let's just tax you on your location. So if I put a bunch of infrastructure in, I'm going to tax you on your potential value, your latent value of your building. So that way, if you just hold real estate, 
you're going to be penalized, a higher tax. Um, Pittsburgh adopted land value taxation in the 70s. So think of it this way. Most American cities, if I have two buildings sitting side by side, they're going to be pretty much the same value. If I knock a building down, I've eliminated its improvement value. So I've actually dropped its taxes down to nothing. So there's a perverse incentive to remove the buildings. Or if you drive, walk around anywhere in your downtown, if you see a surface parking lot, I'm being incentivized to just hang on to it. I might be taxed a little bit more than some neighborhood, but I'm taxed marginally compared to my neighbors that are, that are buildings. So Elizabeth Maggie Phillips was a Georgist. The Georgism was a huge movement in the late 1800s because it was seen as a, as a social leveling of real estate. If you think about being in Boston in the 1800s and your family was the Copleys, you know, you, your, your family came off the Mayflower, you've got all this land, you can hang on to it forever and just bequeath it onto your grandkids and just, they can develop it in the future and make all of this money off you all doing all this investment in the community, right? Elizabeth Maggie Phillip, who has spectacular eyebrows, by the way, um, <laughs> she was a Georgist and she realized adults are too set in their ways, what if we changed policy? What if we changed into this Henry George taxation model and she created a board game that's this. Does it look familiar? <laughs> Monopoly is Georgism. Location is important, land assembly is critical, and when you put buildings on it, that's how you win the game. So as you walk around your community, realize that, that there are people inside your community that are essentially holding the community hostage because they're paying a very low level of taxation with the infrastructure that you all have committed to the property already. That's another way to get to affordability. It's maybe not a construction way, but it, at the very least, if you want to hang on to that property and do nothing with it, great, we need to get this much taxes out of it. This is our two-drink minimum, you know? <laughs> So thank you again, and another big round of applause for everyone.